Hello, my name is David Cahoon, and I've been giving talks on the interpretation and measurement of single ion channels ever since, ever since the first Plymouth meeting, which was in 1984. Later that year, my son was born, and now we're, now he's graduated, and we have two lovely granddaughters. So that indicates how long I've been doing this. But I realized that I have never made a video about single iron channel recording. That's what I spent most of my life on. I've got all sorts of things on my YouTube channel about quackery and about the misinterpretation of p-values and that sort of thing, my later interests, but nothing about my main interest. So here goes. Before starting, let's just have a, a, a some pictures. That the first one was the lab in 2002, I think. This is some video I took from a drone in 2016. There's the marine biology lab. There's the tea room and the esplanade. There's the war memorials, and we come back to. Smeaton's Tower. Then there's a picture of the course, I think the 2016 one, I'm at the right hand end. Then a walk, go to, across Kremel Ferry and to Rame Head, stopping in King Sand for refreshments. There's the hero, David Ogden, with Lucia Civilotti. There's Lucia with her group. They were about 2001, I think. And there's Stephanie Shorger. I'll start off with a quotation from A.J. Clark, one of the pioneers of quantitative pharmacology. Uh, in fact, he, it was really A.V. Hill, another UCL person who, who uh, deserves that accolade more than Clark, but Clark wrote a very prescient book in 1933, and in it he said, in the first place, there is no advantage in fitting curves by a formula unless this expresses some possible physico-chemical process, and it is undesirable to employ formulae that imply impossibilities. He put an emphasis on mechanism. Of course, in 1933, nothing was known about mechanisms, but the sentiment was dead right, I think. For example, most people fitting dose response curves will fit a Hill equation. That's what's quaintly known in graph pad as a sigmoid curve. The problem with the Hill equation is that it, in, it does represent a physical impossibility, namely an infinite strength of reaction between subunits in a, in a channel or receptor. So the numbers that you fit in the equation, the hill slope, for example, has no direct physical interpretation. We aim to have a direct physical interpretation. To get from a single channel recording to the numbers that you want involves some mathematics. And the people who are were responsible for this mathematics, so quite old now. <laughs> Laplace died in 1827. Sylvester coined the word matrix in 1850. Cayley defined the inverse of a matrix in 1853. Markov of Markov processes founded the study of Markov processes, the Markov chain, and Kolmogorov, who died most recently, not till 1987, extended Markov processes to continuous time, which is the case that we're interested in. None of those, of course, were interested in iron channels. The people who applied their work to iron channels were, above all, Alan Hawkes, with whom I wrote my first paper in 1977, 
and he was responsible for most of what's taught in the mathematics of how to do the fits. Frank Ball has also made contributions and some other people have as well. There's a lovely mathematical saying, nothing to do with single channels, but a mathematician is a machine for turning coffee into theorems. So the problem is this, you start off with a record that uh, is a good, great deal longer than the 300 milliseconds shown here with luck. Uh, but it, it's just a random series of channel openings in this recording, the openings of the downward deflections of the channel. This is an actual bit of a recording from a recombinant nicotinic receptor who was recorded ages ago from the screen of a digital oscilloscope actually with a camera pointing at it rather crude but you can see that the openings are very variable length so they're all much the same amplitude and you can also see that some of the shuttings are very brief what exactly is the problem well there's two ways of looking at it. We're trying to solve the binding gating problem, or we're trying to solve the affinity efficacy problem. The idea of the efficacy of an agonist was coined in the 1950s by a chap called Stevenson, but, but the way he formulated it had a basic error in it. Uh, that was in 1956. In 1957, the uh, Bernard Katz formulated the problem more sensibly, but he had, still had no way of solving it. Th this the, the simplest mechanism you can conceive for an agonist working on a channel is this Del Castillo Katz mechanism. There's a binding, a binding reaction in which a receptor R binds an agonist A. And then there's an opening reaction, the gating reaction, you'd call it for an ion channel. And that produces an open channel AR star. So, the response to the agonist reflects both steps, but it's only the first step that tells us about the binding site. And for that reason, you can say that binding experiments, which measure binding to both AR and AR star, don't measure affinity. Not that they don't measure affinity in any sense that's useful for learning about the binding site, or for elucidating structure function relations. This is a very old problem and one still sees people doing a ligand binding experiment and saying that if the binding is changed that reflects, and that means that the binding site has changed. So we can easily illustrate this by some calculations calculations done using this very simple Del Castillo Katz mechanism. On the left hand side there we have graphs for the dose response curves normalized to a maximum response of one as people very often do for a wild type receptor and for a mutant receptor and you can see that the dose response curve is shifted to the right by a factor of about 100 for the mutant receptor. In other words, it takes 100 times the concentration of agonist on the mutant receptor to get the same response as you would on a, a wild type receptor. So the question is, why is the mutant receptor so unresponsive? Is it that the agonist doesn't bind as well to it? <laughs> 
Well, we can detect that by, you would say, by doing a ligand binding experiment, radio ligand binding experiment of the sort that was originated in the 1960s by Sol Snyder and uh, it was actually done better by Humphrey Rang. The, so you do the ligand binding experiment and you, again you find that to get a given amount of binding you need a hundred times the concentration of agonist with the mutant receptor as you do with the wild type. Both in both cases, the mutant curve is shifted to the right by a factor of a hundred. So obviously the mutation has affected the binding site. That, but these curves are calculated with this Del Castillo Katz mechanism, which has a binding step and a gating step or an affinity step and an efficacy step. And if you came to that conclusion, you would be wrong because both these, both, both these results were calculated from this mechanism with the same binding constant, 100 mi micromolar, for both wild type and mutant. But the efficacy step had an equilibrium constant of 200 for the wild type and only one for the mutant. So the difference between the wild type and the mutant was entirely in its ability to open once the agonist had bound and the binding step was the same in each case. So this ligand binding experiment tells you nothing about the ligand binding site, only about the overall result. So how can we solve the problem? How can we get the binding constant separately for the affinity and the efficacy? or more generally the rate constants for the opening and shutting and for the binding and unbinding. Well, what we're faced with is a lot of openings that look something like this. And we see the amplitudes are almost constant, but the durations are very variable. If you have something very variable, uh, a usual way to look at the characteristics is to plot a distribution, a histogram, showing the frequency of openings of different durations. And if you do that, it looks rather like this. The open time in milliseconds and the frequency in bins that are half a millisecond wide doesn't look like the characteristic sort of probability density function that one's used to looking at the Gaussian one in fact it looks more or less, more or less like an exponential curve there are also some complications there are usually more short openings than the exponential curve predicts and of course you can't see very short openings The sort of probability density function that one's used to looking at is this bell-shaped curve. PDF here stands for probability density function, not portable document format. Not all curves are of this Gaussian type though. There's uh, many quantities come out with a positively skewed probability density function. For, for example, the, the log normal distribution, in, this, is, this is a distribution such that the log of the variable would be normally distributed. Yeah, it would follow that. This is positively skew, skewed and that means that the mode is the smallest measure of cent, central tendency, it's less than the mean and less than the median. <laughs> 
This sort of distribution is perhaps best known as the shape of the distribution of personal incomes. It's the reason why it's not a solecism to say that most people earn less than the average income. That's, called, that's obviously uh, ob often cited as being a solecism, but it's not because the mean income, the average income, as in usual parlance means the mean, is here, whereas the most frequent income is much less than that because of the positive skew. There's an example of a still more positively skewed probability density function, and that's the exponential probability density. There, the mode is zero, the most frequent length of a channel opening. If, if this is a, if this is a distribution of channel open times would be zero. And the median is, which cuts off 50% of the area is again, less than the mean. And it's this sort of distribution. Well, if this government is in power much longer, this could represent the distribution of personal incomes where the most frequent value is zero. We saw that the distribution of channel open times was looked exponential in shape. Why should that be the case? Well, it's actually fairly easy to illustrate why it's the case by the old statistical favorite of tossing a coin or throwing a die. What's the distribution of the number of throws until a success of a coin and until a success is achieved. This is an, sort of analogous to the iron channel because if it's sitting in its open state, it's jiggling around all the time and each jiggle can be thought of as an attempt to shut. Every now and then the jiggle will be big enough that it reaches the activation energy for the shutting reaction and the channel will flip from the open conformation to the shut conformation. So the number of jiggles it has to do before it shuts is, is uh, can be thought of as being proportional to the open time. So this is for coin tossing, the probability of success, um, meaning heads, at each throw is 0.5. So the probability that you have to throw it once to get a, a success is 0.5. The probability of getting tails and then heads, that's having to cause it, toss it twice to get a heads, is 0.5 probability of tails times 0.5, the probability of heads, which is 0.25. The probability you'd have to throw it three times to get a head is 0.5 cubed and so on. If you plot that out, it looks like this, the height of the bin halves at every successive attempt. Now consider throwing a die, the probabilities of getting a six, or here the specified number for that matter, at each throw is one sixth, that's unaffected by how many heads have come up previously, how many sixes have come up previously, that's the Markov property. How many times do you have to throw the die to get a six? Well, the probability that you get a six at the third attempt, for example, is five six, that's the probability of not getting a six, the probability of not getting a six again, and then the probability of getting a six, that's 0.116. And if you plot a histogram there, 
each bin is five sixths of the height of the previous one and it looks like uh, already looks quite like an exponential curve If you had an icosahedral die with a probability of one twentieth of getting uh, any particular specified outcome, then the, the curve would look like that. Each bin would be 19 twentieths of the previous height. And you can see without doing the maths that it's approaching an exponential shape curve. Now this exponential probability distribution has an interesting connection with the macroscopic current you see when you open a lot of ion channels almost simultaneously. That's what happens with the end plate current when you stimulate a motor nerve, there's a pulse of agonist concentration. Many channels open almost simultaneously and if you look at the decay of the end plate current, it looks pretty much exponential. This is an actual example of a fit. The solid line through the points is in fact a single exponential curve. And why does that happen? It happens because the lifetimes of individual channel openings are exponentially distributed to a very good approximation at least. If you consider what, what would happen with uh, I think nine separate ion channels here, they all open at the same time. Some shut very soon, more shut very soon than uh, stay open for a long time because of the exponential shape of the probability distribution but a few will stay open for quite a long time and if you sum those you get this exponential curve for the macroscopic current that's a, a lovely connection between the macroscopic and the single channel record I don't think before I got interested in single line channels, I'd ever thought why the curve was uh, for an end plate current was exponential. Well, I sort of looked upon it as the, simply the solution of a differential equation, but now you can picture it in terms of what the individual channels are doing. If, if you thought about it, if each channel stayed open for a fixed time after it had opened, then the end plate current would look rectangular. They'd stay open for a fixed length of time, then they'd all shut at once, which is not how an end plate current looks at all, of course. So that's the example we just showed where the channels open all at once, but there's another case. And in the 1960s, I remember being very baffled by this case. I used to argue with Donald Jenkinson on the stairs about why it could be, and I could not understand it at all. It's probably lucky that I already had developed the habit of wasting time drinking coffee with people cleverer than I am. And I asked around in the houseman room, the senior common room at UCL one lunchtime to who could answer this puzzle and I was pointed to a chap called Alan Hawkes and that was the start of a, a great uh, friendship and collaborative work. The puzzling question is this, you can see that the time constant for this exponential here is the mean lifetime of the channel openings. But this is uh, comes about when all the channels are opened almost simultaneously. A, a more common case in an experiment would be when the agonist concentration was high for a while 
and then it was suddenly decreased to zero. You again see the channels shutting and following an exponential curve in the macroscopic current. And I had read in a book on colloid chemistry that the time constant for this exponential decay was the same as the mean open lifetime of the channel. Now that makes a lot of sense in the case where the channels open simultaneously. But what about this case? The lifetime starts at a, a random time. And if you look at it, some individual channels, you see that they're open for a while before t equals zero. You then remove the agonist and the channel shuts. Oh, this, this is actually calculated for a different example, for a simple binding reaction in which the binding site is occupied for a while. Then when you wash it out, the, there's no more bindings take place, but it's a while before the molecule dissociates. Some bindings last for quite a short time, some last for much longer, just as on the left. So if you measure the time from t equals zero, the moment that the uh, agonist was, the, the binding molecule was removed from the solution, concentration fell to zero, then you'd expect these thick bits to be exponentially distributed just as the total length of the binding is exponentially distributed. But in every case, the molecule has been bound for longer than the thick bit. So you'd expect, uh, oops, you'd expect that since the t equals zero is equally likely to occur anywhere in the, during the occupancy, you'd expect by symmetry that the actual lifetime of the occupancies would be twice the length, uh, twice the time constant for this curve because this curve is only measuring half of each occupancy. And that's not the case. The textbook of colloid chemistry that I'd read was quite right. I just couldn't see why it was right. Um, there's an important thing to notice here that there's this channel at the bottom, number 10, doesn't appear in here because although it had been occupied in the past, it wasn't occupied at the moment that the concentration was reduced to zero. And so it doesn't feature in the decay of the occupancy. And this was explained to me by Alan Hawkes, or at least he pointed out to me that it's all explained in volume two of Fellows Applied Probability, which I went and got from the library. And so it was, it's called the waiting time paradox. How can it be so? Well, the answer is quite subtle. It's a question of length biased sampling. Let's go back to the previous slide. If an occupancy of the channel happens to be short, then it's un that channel is unlikely to, that, that binding site is unlikely to feature. It's likely to be one of these. But if an occupancy happens to be particularly long, it's more likely to be in existence at the moment that you reduce the concentration to zero. And that means that the channels that are occupied at any up 
random moment when you reduce the concentration are not typical of all channels. In fact, they're twice as long as all channels. So there are a lot more that look like this than look like these ones that are occupied at zero time. And if you do the algebra, the algebra is actually in the appendix two of my old statistics textbook, Lectures on Biostatistics, which you can get now for free, downloaded from my blog, dcscience.net. There's a link in the left-hand column. Um, you find that the mean length of the occupancies that are in existence at any arbitrary moment is actually twice the length of all occupancies. But in this experiment, you only measure half of them. So what you get is an exponential curve, which has a time constant of, which is equal to the mean lifetime of the occupancy or the mean lifetime of an open channel if you're measuring channel open times. So you get exactly the same result as you do on the left, despite, but on the right it's a much more tortuous argument to realise it. The way the waiting time paradox is often introduced, it wasn't certainly wasn't in Feller in the in terms of binding reactions or channel openings. But a, a good way to look at it is the bus waiting time paradox. If you have, suppose that you're waiting for a bus and the bus comes absolutely regularly at 10 minute intervals on the hour, 10 past, 20 past, half past, then you arrive at a bus stop at a random moment, how long on average do you have to wait for a bus? Uh, the answer pretty evidently is five minutes because you have an equal chance of arriving after a bus has just gone or, or arriving just before the next bus arrives. So if there's a 10 minute interval between buses, you've got a five minute waiting time on average. But now suppose a, a, a different question. Suppose that the buses arrive at random intervals and the mean number of buses, the mean interval between buses is still 10 minutes, but rather than arriving regularly at 10 minute intervals, they arrive at random intervals, which have a mean of 10 minutes. This is uh, by random intervals, of course, one means exponentially distributed intervals. That's what you mean by a random interval. So suppose now there's just as many buses per day and you arrive at the bus stop. At random, how long do you have to wait? And the answer is no longer five minutes. It's actually 10 minutes. You have to wait twice as long if the arrivals are at random than if the buses are regular. So less than the bus companies could do with learning. How can this be? Because there's still a bus every 10 minutes on average, but you still have to wait the whole 10 minutes on average before the next bus comes. Well, it can be because if there happens to be a long interval between buses, you're more likely to arrive in that interval. When you say you arrive at the bus stop at a random time, you mean a time unrelated to the actual movement of the buses, and you have an equal chance of arriving in any particular millisecond. And that means that you have a, a bigger chance of arriving in a long interval than a short one. 
And in fact, it turns out that by turning up at the bus stop at random, you have selected intervals which are longer than average. In fact, they're exactly twice as long as average, it turns out. So the average length of the interval in which you turn up will be 20 minutes long. You've got an equal chance of turning up anywhere in it. So it takes, on average, 10 minutes, half of that interval, to for the next bus to come. This was a huge revelation to me. I gave a talk about it at the Pharmacological Society in the 1970 or so. I got so excited I broke the pointer. So that is the waiting time paradox. There's a related one. These paradoxes all depend on a phenomenon called length bias sampling. It's a bit as if you dipped your hand to pick out uh, into a bag of sticks to pick out a stick, but the sticks were not all the same length. So you might pick a stick at random, but you'd have a better chance of picking a long stick than a short one because there's more to get hold of. And this sort of length bias sampling trap, which is very easy to fall into, has a number uh, of applications in the world of iron channels. For example, you might ask, is it possible to tell whether a burst of openings of an iron channel is ended by dissoci dissociation of the agonist from the open iron channel? Can you tell whether it's ended by dissociation of agonists by seeing whether the last opening in the burst is on average shorter than the others? And the answer is no, you can't. There's another uh, fallacy uh, of this sort, which is quite amusing. In 1995, I was giving a journal club in the lab we used to have regular journal clubs about a paper from by Lynn and Stevens. This is the famous Chuck Stevens. And they wanted to tell whether the desensitization of an iron channel occurred by a transition from the open state or from a shut state. This is an old problem, which is still to this day largely unresolved, I might say. So what they did was to, well, to assess the desensitization, they put on a large test pulse uh, of high agonist concentration, just measured the size of the macroscopic response to it. This was preceded by an exposure to agonist, which would produce the desensitization to a low concentration of agonist, but sufficient to cause desensitization. And then they divided up the recordings into those in which one or more channel openings were seen during this desensitizing pre-exposure and those in which no openings are seen. And it was found that there's more desensitization in the cases where an opening was seen during the desensitizing exposure than when it wasn't, when there were no ch channel openings seen during the desensitization period. So they concluded that desensitization proceeds faster from the open state than from a shut state. I got five minutes into this journal club and I suddenly realized, sort of paused in my explanation of what was going on, because I suddenly realized that it was really not true, their argument. Their argument had a fallacy. So I wrote to Alan Hawkes, he used to in the 90s, well, maybe we, I probably emailed him in the mid 90s. 
and we did the necessary theory and you don't like the theory is in a 1995 paper we wrote in pnas but you don't need the theory to see that the answer that this simply doesn't work consider this very oversimplified mechanism for a an nmda receptor in which one agonist is bound a second agonist is bound and the channel can open or the channel can desensitize in this mechanism the desensitization is taking place entirely from a shut state notice this is the only open state and that doesn't communicate directly with the desensitized state now this mechanism is going to postulate is going to show exactly the result that was shown for a start during the sensitization period many of the channels will never reach beyond occupied and resting vacant they won't even get to the stage where they could desensitize or they could open others will reach to here and then desensitize and then go back this way so there'll be no channel opening but if the channel opens then you, that means that there will have to be at least two sojourns in this particular state one as it's opening and one as it's coming back from the opening and that gives it two chances to desensitize whereas so, many of the channels that uh, didn't show an opening never got even as far as having one chance if the open channel oscillates a few times between those states there'll be uh, many chances for the channel to desensitize so you expect more desensitization from this mechanism even in cases where there was a channel opening during the desensitizing pre-pulse even though this mechanism shows desensitization entirely occurring from a shut state the the, the whole paper of Lyndon Stevens was based on a, a misconception which is the sort that's only too easy to make okay so now in the next step we can give a general rule if the channel behaves in a markovian way and there's no reason to think that channels don't so far we can give one very simple rule the lifetime in any single state is exponentially distributed and the mean lifetime is one over the sum of all transition rates that lead away from the state in question that's a very simple rule it's a starting point for all our analyses though in real life there are always several shut states which need to communicate with each other and there's often several open states too and this means that an observed shut time will usually consist of oscillations between several different shut states you can't see which particular shut state it's in because all the shut states have the same zero conductance so the observed shut time is the sum of a random number of random lifetimes in several different intercommunicating shut states so what we're dealing with is not so much a Markov process as an aggregated Markov process let's keep it simple for the moment though and just consider where we're interested in the lifetime of individual states take this example this is the simple del castillo cats mechanism vacant receptor occupied receptor open channel and then we can add some channel block 
a channel blocker molecule B can associate with the open channel and shut off the current through it. And the rate constants for the blockage is K plus B and for the unblockage is K minus B. So we can immediately see that the mean open time, there's only a single open state here. So we haven't got the complications of the aggregated Markov process. The time constant is one over the sum of the rate constants for leaving the open state. And those rate constants are alpha for shutting and for blockage, they're K plus B times the blocker concentration. Notice that association rate constants have to be multiplied by the concentration to get them into a transition rate. Here's a second example of a, sink, a slightly more subtle uh, agonist mechanism than the Del Castillo cats. This is one that has three shut states because you can have, uh, either have one agonist molecule bound or two agonist molecules bound. And then a single open state. It's got one more step in than the Del Castillo cats because it requires two agonist molecules to open the channel according to this mechanism. So what you'll get is molecules binding and unbinding and every so often it'll open and when it opens it may do some oscillations between these two states before an agonist dissociates. So what's the mean lifetime of this single shut state here? Well it's one over the sum of the rate constants for leaving it. With the rate constants for leaving it are the channel opening rate constant beta and the dissociation rate constant, which is 2K minus two. The, it's, it's twice the K minus two is the dissociation rate constant per site, but there are two sites, either of which can dissociate. So you've got a factor of two in there. Now, in fact, there are three intercommunicating shut states here. So in principle, the distribution of shut times is a mixture of three exponential distributions. But if this one is much faster than the others, then you can measure it roughly. OK, we're going to have a diversion now into something slightly more complicated. Um, so you can hold your breath if you don't like complicated things, but uh, you can still get the gist of the rest of the talk. Here we have the old Del Castillo and Katz 1957 mechanism again. The law of mass, how do we solve the kinetics of that? Uh, that mechanism? Well, the law of mass action says the rate of any reaction is proportional to the product of the reactant concentrations. So if P subscript one represents the fraction in state one, that's the open state then the rate of change of that with time, the rate of the reaction will be minus alpha times P1. That's the rate of loss from state one, which is alpha times the concentration or measured by the, the concentration is replaced by the proportion occupied in this case. So that's the loss of state one, the rate of increase of state one is the concentration of, of this 
species state two times the opening rate constant. That's the rate of formation of state one. Likewise, for states two and states three, for state three, for example, the resting state, unoccupied state, the rate of loss is the rate at which binding occurs, which is K plus one times the binding concentration times the amount in state three, plus the rate of formation of state three, which is K minus one times the concentration of the intermediate state. So we've got three equations and three unknowns. Well, actually there's only two unknowns because <coughs> we're measuring the concentrations by the occupancies and the occupancies must add up to one. So we can eliminate one of those terms and we can give a solution for the number of open channels at time t which has this form is the sum of two exponentials which have two rate constants lambda one and lambda two and two amplitudes w1 and w2 these exponential terms decay to zero as time goes to infinity so that time goes to infinity will the occupancy is this equilibrium occupancy I'm not going to go through how you get the values for those how you get this solution but beyond saying that the two rate constants here are solutions of a quadratic equation where the coefficient for lambda is the sum of all the rate constants in the mechanism, there's four of them, and the product of the two macroscopic rate constants is given by this, and that means you can solve the quadratic equations for the two rates of decay. The amplitude of the two components can be is a little more complicated to find but I've got a handout in which it's given. Now we get to the more advanced bit. The trouble is if you had to go through this sort of procedure for every single mechanism you would find it would get very long indeed. Furthermore if you had more than uh, four states, you couldn't solve it at all. <coughs> but there is a very elegant solution to this, and that solution is known as matrix algebra. I'm not going to teach it now, though I shall soon make a second video in which I give you the, in one not particularly long talk, give you the elements of what you need to know about matrices to understand it because it's a wonderful notation. It's a notation, it's not a new idea, it's not like learning calculus, it's just a notation. Um, so let's just have a quick delve into what you can do with matrix algebra. We started with three simultaneous equations. Now let's define a table which is has one row and three columns and the three entries in it are the occupancies at time of, of state one, the occupancies of state two and the occupancies of state three at time t. And we denote this with a, a bold p because that stands for that whole table. And this table is known as a matrix. A matrix is merely a table of numbers. 
it is a one by three matrix, one row and three columns, and uh, uh, a matrix with uh, one dimension of it being one is known as a vector. So we can call it a vector of occupancies. Then we define a three by three table or matrix, which contains the transition rates. The ith row contains the transition rate from state i to state j. So from state one to state two, that's the shutting reaction, that was rate constant alpha. From state two to state one, that's the, the second row and the first column, is the opening rate constant beta. Likewise, from state three to state two is the association rate, and from state two to state three was the dissociation rate. It's only the off-diagonal elements that matter here because you can't define the rate of a, 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 a transition of a state to itself. The diagonal elements are simply constructed such that the sum of every row is zero. That turns out to be the most convenient way to do it. So if you, once you define these things, then the three simultaneous equations can be written much more simply, simply as, as this. Not only does it look simpler than that, but it's perfectly general. It holds not only for three states, but for any number of states. And notice too that this Q matrix, the transition rate matrix, defines the mechanism entirely. It's got the transition rate constants from every state to every other state if states are disconnected as one and three are in the Del Castillo Katz mechanism, then that entry is just zero. There's no way you can go directly from one to the other. So this defines the mechanism entirely. And the Q matrix is really central to every stochastic calculation. More generally, the elements of the Q matrix in the ith row and the jth column, Q subscript IJ, is the rate constant for the transition from state I to state J. And all of the entries in the Q matrix have reciprocal units of reciprocal time. So X is the free concentration of ligand, which multiplies the association rate constant so that they're in time, in units of reciprocal time. In order to take advantage of the simplification of things by using single channels, we can notice that any matrix can be divided into rectangular subsections, each of which itself is a matrix or a submatrix, a partition matrix, we call it. We'll often want to divide the K states in a mechanism into K subscript A open states, which we are set A, and K subscript F shut states, which are set F. We divide all the states into open states and shut states, and denote the open states A and the shut states set F. So the total number of states is Ka plus Kf. So for the Del Castillo-Katz mechanism, there's the Q matrix, and we can divide it into open states and shut states that way. And this top left-hand corner is open to open, A to A. This bottom right-hand corner is shut to shut transition, so we've 
it's F to F. The top right hand corner is open to shut transition, so it's AF and this is FA. So we can write the Q matrix as a partition matrix shut partitioned into open states and shut states like that. And the sub matrices uh, well, we've just defined QAA is just that entry alone. QFF is the shut states bit. Shut to open is that. Open to shut is that. We can now see the huge virtue of the matrix notation. If we are dealing with a simple two-state mechanism like Del Castillo Katz, then we can write, sorry, like a simple binding reaction or a, with only two states, not three, then we can write the macroscopic currents will decay in a way described by this simple exponential decay. That's for the fraction in state one. But in general, we can get the fraction in any state at time t for any mechanism and write it down in this matrix form. The, this is the occupancy, the, the row vector of occupancies at time t. That's the, oops, that's that occupancies at time zero and that's e to the qt. What the exponential of a matrix means we can see in a, the other talk that I'll give on matrices. So this is not only a lot simpler looking than that, but it's also perfectly general. Likewise, the distribution of open times when there's only one open state would be simply an exponential distribution with a rate constant, which would be one over the shutting rate. But the distribution of open times for any mechanism can be written in this way, where Q subscript AA is that sub matrix of the whole Q matrix, the bit that refers to open states only. And this you can see is exactly analogous to that with the rate constants being replaced by minus QAA. This comes after the exponential because when you're multiplying matrices, the order matters. The only difference is between the very single open state form and this perfectly general form is that we have an initial vector, which is one by Ka, the Ka being the number of open states, and that gives you the probabilities and opening starts in any individual open state. And a unit vector at the end, which just adds up over the open states. Otherwise, it looks exactly like the special case of a single open state. Likewise, the distribution of shut times for the Castillo-Katz mechanism has this sort of form, sum of two exponentials, but the distribution of shut times for any mechanism looks uh, like this. Uh, you, you notice you've just replaced A, the open states, by F, the shut states, and, and, and bingo, we've got the answer. Okay, now let's think about open channel block again in terms of what's going on at a single channel. <laughs> 
we're thinking in terms of the mechanism that I put up earlier, in which you have Del Castillo Katz mechanism followed by a single selective blockage of the open state. So the, 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 the mechanism is, is sort of in a straight line. What happens at the, at the level of a, a single molecule is that the channel can be vacant for a while. It can then become occupied in the singly occupied but shut state. It can then become open. And while it's open, it may be blocked for a while. It may then return from the blockage and be open for a while, blocked again open for a while, blocked again, open for a while, and then it, the, the agonist dissociates, it's in that intermediate state, and then it dissociates altogether in the resting state. So that's what's happening at the single molecule level, but of course you can't see the transitions among the, these two shut states. So what you, all you see is when it opens, which is there, the, the opening is shown as a downward deflection. And we see three, the three blockages as interruptions of between the openings. There's also another possibility, of course, that the channel is occupied here. It opens there but it shuts again before it ever gets blocked. So that produces a burst of openings that has no blockages in it. Now the mean duration of a blockage is one over the rate constant for recovery from the blocked state, one over K minus B, that's a constant. The mean channel open time is one over the shutting rate plus the blockage rate, the rate constants for leaving the open state, and that decreases as the blocker concentration increases. The mean number of openings per burst also increases with the blocker concentration, but the mean total mean open time in this, these bursts of openings is not shortened, it's just one over alpha. But the mean length of a burst increases with the blocker concentration. There's an example here, which is for an NMDA receptor. In the absence of magnesium, it looks like that. There are short shuttings which reflect the gating mechanism, but in the presence of magnesium, quite a high concentration, the openings become much shorter. And this gives rise to some fallacies and paradoxes all based on length by a sampling, which can be easily understood, I hope, at this stage. In the presence of a simple channel blocker, a op selective open channel blocker, that means individual openings are shortened, but the total open time per burst should be unchanged. H how can this be? How does the channel remember how long it was open for <laughs> before the blockage to add it to the open time after the blockage so the total open time adds up to one over alpha. Well the answer is it doesn't remember it at all. You can think of it as the blockage is sort of stopping the clock on a single opening. Uh, and that's why the, the total open time remains unchanged. Another interesting example of a fallacy is the unblocked channel fallacy. Why do the channel openings get 
shorter in the presence of a channel blocker? Well, because the channel opens, but the blocker hops in and cuts short the opening before it would otherwise have ended. So what about the channels that never got blocked? We showed an example of that in the last slide. Some channels will just open and the blocker won't ever pop in and they'll shut. So they should be normal channel openings, right? They've never seen the blocker. Put in another way, the last opening in a burst, which ends by the channel shutting rather than being blocked, should also have a normal length. No, 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 no. Why is that the case? It's because for length bias sampling reasons again. If an opening happens to be a long one, then it is more likely that the channel blocker will pop in and cut it short. If the channel opening happens to be a short one, it's unlikely that it will be cut short by a blocker because the blocker hasn't got so long to get in. So it so works out very elegantly that a channel which ends its opening by being blocked will be shorter than usual by exactly the same amount as the channel which just shuts without ever being blocked. The ones that are that never get blocked will be shorter than average and they'll be shorter than average to exactly the same extent as if they had been blocked. That's sexy if anything is to me. Okay, another uh, way of looking at it. There's the simple Del Castillo cat's mechanism again. I pointed out earlier that the decay of a synaptic current, uh, the, uh, at least at the neuromuscular end plate, is pretty close to a single exponential. How can that be? Because there are three states here, and that means there should be two exponentials to describe the macroscopic decay. This was a puzzle right from the start in the uh, <coughs> 70s and 80s. And it was always supposed that one of these steps must be rate limiting, either the binding or the opening must be rate limiting, the other reaction being much faster so it doesn't appear in the kinetics. Or it's too fast to appear. It was a common assumption, one made originally by Anderson and Stevens, that the binding reaction is fast and that the opening and shutting reaction is rate limiting. So what happens if the binding constants are very fast? Here are the three states of the receptor, resting, occupied, and open. Here's what you actually see, the openings of the channels. Well, if the binding is very fast, then bindings will occur frequently at any particular free agonist concentration, but they'll also dissociate fast. So most of the bindings won't produce any effect because the binding reaction is, is so fast. It'll go there and there and there and there and there and there and there. But every now and then it will open. Here's a case where it goes from the intermediate state to the open state. We then see an opening. Then you're back to the fruitless occupancies. <laughs> 
and another opening and another one. So if this were the case, openings would occur almost always singly like that, but it's clearly not very efficient because the you know, most of the bindings don't produce an opening. Consider the opposite case at the bottom where the conformation change is very fast and the binding is the rate limiting step. In that case, once the channel has become occupied, it won't become occupied that often because the association rate is relatively slow. Once it's become occupied, it'll it'll almost certainly open and when it gets back to here it'll almost certainly open again so you get a long burst of openings between these two states before there's a dissociation <coughs> and this doesn't look at all like what you see this this could be what you see but there's an intermediate state which was forgotten about at first though it's well known in enzymes And that is the case where neither of these states is rate limiting, but one of them occurs only in a very low concentration. This can also give the appearance of there being a single exponential rather than two. So suppose the opening rate was fast and the dissociation rate was fast. The lifetime of this would be very short or in macroscopic terms, the concentration of it would be low compared with the concentration here and the concentration of open ones. So in that case, you get a binding here, then an opening. When it gets, uh, when it's open, it has to return to the resting state. Now, from the resting state, it can either, this, this intermediate shut state, it can either dissociate or it can open those are both comparable rates so it's got a sort of uh, rather similar chance of doing either in this case it reopens once and then returns to the resting state so that gives you two openings in rather quick succession because the lifetime of this intermediate state is is low some of course will become occupied without opening there's one there and one there it'll just return to the unoccupied state in this case it becomes occupied opens three times before it shuts in this case it just opens once before it shuts in this case it opens four times before the agonist dissociates and it's over so you can see this predicts that openings will occur in bursts of openings separated by rather short shut times. Those shut times being sojourns in this intermediate state. And this in fact is very like what one sees because it's very frequent for the opening is to be interrupted by short shuttings. In fact, you shouldn't be really regard it as a single opening being interrupted by short shuttings. You should regard it as an opening followed by a short shutting followed by a new opening. That's just words there. So notice too that according to this mechanism openings occur singly so you'd expect that the lifetime for the synaptic current the time constant for the decay of a synaptic current or the mean open lifetime you got from a single channel record or the time constant you get from noise analysis would be close to the mean open time of the channel and this was <coughs> famously the postulate of Anderson and Stevens, 1973. The binding was the right, was fast, the rate limiting step was the opening and that openings occurred singly. <coughs>
In fact, when you do calculations based on the Cassio Katz model, you, you can't actually get physically plausible rate constants that give rise to that situation. And furthermore, the openings are, do, do have these interruptions. So we concluded that neither of the individual steps was rate limiting, but we had this intermediate case. And that means that the time constant for the synaptic current is not the mean open lifetime, but it's the mean length of these bursts of openings. These bursts are the fundamental unit of synaptic transmission, if you like. Furthermore, these are the time constants you get for the decay of the synaptic current and also from noise analysis. It'll all be the mean burst length rather than the mean open time as it's been supposed up to that time. So we have a record like this, which has openings with short interruptions in them. If you blow up that one, for example, you look, you have at least two openings during this burst. If this is a real very brief shutting, then you'd actually have three openings during that burst. This is a, a problem of the idealization of the record into a list of open and shut times, whether you count this or not. But let's consider it in terms of this simple mechanism where you have a binding, a second binding, and then an opening reaction, then the mean open time, these individual openings, not the whole burst of openings, one, two, three, would be one over alpha, the shutting rate constant. The mean lengths of the short interruptions, if we interpret these interruptions as sojourns in that state, because it's oscillating between these two states, then the mean length of the short shuttings would be one over the sum of the rates for leaving it, which is the opening rate constant and the dissociation rate constant. So to be one over beta plus 2k minus 2. You can also <coughs> work out that the mean number of interruptions in a burst would be beta over 2k minus 2. So between these you can solve for the opening rate constant and the beta two and the dissociation rate constant. And it was crude calculations of that sort that first allowed estimation of all the rate constants in the mechanism. For that sort of mechanism, we found that the rate constant for opening was indeed fast. The rate constant for shutting was also fast, for dissociation, sorry. So the assumptions of the intermediate case were, were pretty much fulfilled. This enabled us for the first time really to see the basis for differences in potencies between two agonists. We'll just take acetylcholine and subaraldicholine. The subaraldicholine is five or six times more potent than acetylcholine. But why is it more potent? Is it because it has more affinity or because it has more efficacy? Well, the opening rate constant came to 30,000 
for acetylcholine, 18,000, for subaraldicholine. The mean open lifetime, if not for individual openings, was pretty similar for both of them. The ratio of those two gave the rate constant, the equilibrium constant for the gating reaction, beta of alpha, the measure of efficacy, as 43 for acetylcholine and 29 for subaraldicholine. So you can see that the more potent agonist had actually a slightly lower efficacy than the less potent acetylcholine. But if we look at the dissociation <coughs> rates, we see that the dissociation rate for subaldicholine is only about a quarter of that for acetylcholine and consequently the ratio of dissociation to association rate constants The, in other words, the equilibrium constant for the binding step separately was a lot lower. In other words, more potent, more strong for acetylcholine, for, for subaraldicholine than it was for acetylcholine. So <clears throat> the extra potency of subaraldicholine is actually entirely due to its increased a binding of affinity for the first step not at all due to an increased efficacy because the efficacy was actually slightly decreased for that more potent agonist so this was the first really description of efficacy in terms of individual rate constants the analysis was crude but it's all we could do in the 1980s Right, so those methods that were used to get those <coughs> rate constants worked in this way. We got, we had to idealize the record into openings and shuttings of different lengths. In this case, a, a shut time of three milliseconds, an, an open time of 64 microseconds followed by a shut time of 35 microseconds this is this is made from the observed record it's not a flawless process of course there are some ambiguous ones but it's the best we can do and that that's the first stage in 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 all uh, analyses. So what we did then was to display the data as distributions of open times, shut times, burst lengths and correlations for example and we'd try to guess the number of exponentials needed to fit them the number of exponentials needed to fit the shut time distribution in principle is the number of shut states, but in practice, the number of shut states is almost always bigger. So we should call it the minimum for the number of shut states. And then we'd have to guess some sort of mechanism and attempt to estimate the physical rate constants retrospectively from the distributions. This is pretty unsatisfactory what we want to do is to be able to estimate the physical rate constants, the Q matrix, in other words, from the observations in a, a, a much more direct way. And that was not possible because of, uh, in the eighties, because of the problem of missed events the distributions of open times, for example, 
are curtailed here because you can't see open times longer than a certain length, typically sort of 30 microseconds or something like that. What that means is that the open times are all longer than they should be because they have some missed short shuttings in them. Each time you miss a short shutting, the opening appears to continue, so it's extended by the fact that each time you miss a short shutting. It's usually the shuttings are the problem more than the openings, but you can also say the same that shuttings will be longer than they uh, should be if you miss a short opening. But once you can solve that problem, and that problem was solved in 1980 and 19, sorry, 1990, and then again in 1992 by Hawks and Jalali, with a little help from me, not much, they found the distribution of the apparent open time, allowing for missed events, missed short shuttings, and the distribution of the apparent shut time allowing for missed short openings, missed because they were too short to be detected. And this allowed us to calculate the probability of observing what we did observe given some particular model. That probability is called the likelihood and if we maximize the parameters in the model in such a way as to maximize the likelihood, then that's a maximum likelihood estimate and that's a very good way of doing the fitting process. So another improvement that we brought about was uh, the ability to fit several different records at different concentrations simultaneously. So the data in, in our current method of fitting would be, say, glycine at 10 micromolar, 100 micromolar, 300, and 1,000 micromolar for each of them. You have a list of open and shut times. And then you postulate a possible mechanism for the reaction. By postulating it at this stage rather than at the end, you know exactly how many exponentials there should be in the distribution. This, this is for a homomeric glycine receptor in which we postulate that there might be five sequential bindings and each of these liganded states could open. So there'd be five open states and the uh, the open time distribution should be fitted by the sum of five exponentials. Likewise, six shut states, so there should be six exponentials in the shut time distribution. But you don't have to fit the distributions and to fit those exponentials to the distributions. That's not part of the mechanism. If you, if you combine those two, you need to maximize the likelihood of seeing this data given the mechanism and you adjust the rate constant in this mechanism so as to maximize the probability of seeing your data. And that gives you estimates of the rate constants. For example, the shutting rate constant is 1,250 seconds to the minus one. The opening rate constant is very fast, 120,000 reciprocal seconds. And you can also get errors for those approximate errors for them from the fitting mechanism in a way I won't go into now. Of course, this has produced a list of rate constants 
you then want to see whether these make break constants describe the data accurately. I'll just go through quickly what um, the, the, the method for the maximum likelihood fit. Here's the first two openings in a sequence of maybe 12,000. Open for two milliseconds, shut for 10 milliseconds, open for five milliseconds. <coughs> What's the likelihood of that sequence? Well, it's the probability that the channel is open for two milliseconds times the probability, or probability density actually, since we're specifying an exact duration, times the probability that it shut for 10 milliseconds and it had previously been open for two milliseconds times the probability that the second opening is five milliseconds given that the first shut time was 10 and the open time was first open time was two and so on now these probabilities all depend on the values for the rate constants and they can be calculated with exact allowance for missed events by the methods of Hawkes, Jalali and so on. And these values for the rate constants are adjusted until the likelihood is maximized. So to infer whether a mutation affects the binding site, we need the values for all these underlying rate constants. This and this sort of method of its what we want to know directly to the observations, so avoiding entirely the difficult step of fitting exponentials to distributions and the inference of the values of the rate constants from them. I can give a rough idea of how the calculation is done. Um, we can define in terms of the Q matrix, a another matrix, a G matrix, A is the set of all open states, F is the set of all, set of all shut states. And each element of this G matrix, which we can call G I J of T, the element in the i row and j's column, and they give the probability densities for staying with the open state within the open state set A for a time T and then leaving for a shut state J all this conditional and starting in open state I. And this is calculated simply from the subsections of the Q matrix. So there's nothing mysterious about it, but it's what we need for calculating the likelihood We have to start with an, a, a 1 by Ka vector, Ka is the number of open states, giving the probability that the open state starts in each of the individual open states. We then have to multiply that by GAF for the first open time, that's the probabilities of staying Within, uh, within within the open state for a time T01 and eventually leaving for a shut state and we multiply by the same thing for the first shut time G the problem these this matrix contains the probabilities of staying within the shut states for a time S1 followed by leaving to the open states and the if you look at the product of these first two terms, they're a one by KF vector, which is the probability that this shut, state, this shut state starts in each of the individual shut states. Then for open time two, we multiply by GAF of O2 and this, bit is a one by 
ka vector which gives you the initial vector for the second open time and so on we go through all the open times and shut times and at the end we sum up over the shut states this is a, a unit vector of ones which has the effect of adding up over the shut states and the result of this enormous concentration is a one by one matrix in other words it's a scalar number it's the likelihood So having done that, we need to test the quality of the fit. This is uh, for, uh, again, for a homomeric glycine receptor. We find that if we postulate five equivalent bindings, followed by each of them can open, that then the observed open, the observed shut times look like the histogram and the best fit you can get is this blue line which is lousy and that's the dis that's the the red bit is the dis the deviation of the fitted curve from the histogram on the other hand if you assume three bindings but not necessarily with the same equilibrium constant, you can get a much better fit. So now I'd like to go through two examples of the fitting of mechanisms with HJC fit. That's the fitting program that I mentioned. First, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the human one, both the wild type and a mutant that causes slow channel myasthenic syndrome in man. <coughs> and secondly, the heterometic, heteromeric glycine receptor. First of all, this is how we test whether a fitted mechanism is a good fit or not. These are for a nicotinic receptor. The, the, this is the apparent open times. I say apparent because that is to indicate that, we're, that the open times have been extended by missed short chuck times. The histogram shows the data. The solid blue line shows the prediction from the fitted mechanism and rate constants. So you can see that the fit is very good. The apparent shut time it only goes up to 10 milliseconds, you see, because we can't be sure we've only got one channel, so we're only using short shut times. Um, again, the blue line fits the data well. These bottom two concern correlations, as is any program which will allow you to test the, the predictions of correlations. This is the, the blue histogram are the, dis, the observed distribution of conditional open times. They're only for the openings which are adjacent to very short shut times. And you can see that these open times that are next to short shut times don't have the short openings in them. They are almost all long openings. This is the dis this, the dis the dotted line is the distribution of all openings, and you can see that 
the, you tend to get long openings next to short shuttings. This is a more synoptic way of looking at the same thing. This is the mean open time, mean apparent open time for openings which are next to shut times which are in various specified ranges. The blue dots with their standard deviations are the mean open times which were observed. The red is the prediction from the fit and again it all fits very well. Using this sort of uh, mechanism for the myasthenic mutant receptor. This was a, a receptor which had a single point mutation from leucine to phenylalanine in the epsilon subunit, the one characteristic of the adult receptor. We're fitting a slightly more complicated mechanism than the ones we've mentioned so far in this case. With allowing the two binding sites on the receptor to be different. So this is the unoccupied state and we have a, a different rate constant for binding to one site than for binding to the other side. This allows for the dissociation of the doubly occupied receptor can also be different for the two subunits. Only the doubly receptor, well, the doubly recept occupied receptor opens best with a rate constant of 51,000 but the singly occupied, the two different sorts of singly occupied receptor can also open. Those are the numbers for the wild type. These are the numbers for the mutant receptor. So we see that the opening rate was somewhat bigger for the mutant receptor. The shutting rate was somewhat slower, but by far the biggest difference was in the dissociation rate, the total dissociation rate from both the receptors, which is 14,000 for the wild type, but only 4,600 for the mutant. So the main effect of the mutation is to slow the agonist dissociation from the shut state and that when the agonist is dissociates more slowly here then the channel will more often reopen and and that will prolong the burst of openings that accounts for why it's a slow channel myasthenic mutant So in that case, the rate constants from the fit and the mechanism from the fit were used to calculate the response to a very brief pulse of agonist. And the number it gave for the wild type was a predominant time constant of 2.3 milliseconds. 
whereas for the mutant, the predominant time constant for the decay to a pulsive agonist was uh, 16.3, a sevenfold slower. And some somebody had, uh, House had done biopsied muscle from a patient with this um, myasthenic syndrome and found about a sevenfold slower decay of the end plate current. So that all fits rather nicely. Now, the last example, which is for a heteromeric glycine receptor, alpha-1, beta. This shows the responses of the receptor to three different concentrations. This is on a compressed time scale, that's one millisecond. This is 50 milliseconds. Of course, the openings get more frequent as the concentration goes up. You can measure the fraction of time for which an individual channel is open during one of these bursts of activity. That gives you the probability of being open. And when you can do that, you can't always do it. It is by far the best sort of dose response curve to have. <coughs> it looks like an ordinary dose response curve, the fraction of channels that are open against log of agonist concentration. But it, is, has, it goes up to one, of course, because it's a fraction of channels at home, but it's not being normalized to one. This in fact goes up to 96%. So, it's the only sort of dose where you can get a dose response curve that doesn't need normalization. It gives you an absolute value. And that allows you to calculate the efficacy, at least in cases, if it went up to 0.7, say, that would give you an idea that it was a partial agonist. Once it gets up to as high as 96, it's difficult to measure the small differences between maximum P open but it is a wonderful method of getting a dose response curve when you can do the trick. Now, the investigation of the glycine receptor gave rise to some very interesting insights. It is a good receptor to investigate because the concentration dependence of the distributions is much more marked than for the nicotinic receptor. So it gives you a better idea of what's happening when the receptor is not fully liganded. And that's a valuable thing to know. Now to a first approximation at least, the nicotinic channel behaves as though the binding to one site on the channel is unaffected by binding to the other. The binding sites are independent. But that's not true of the glycine receptor. At least it's not true if you fit it in a standard sort of way with three agonist molecules being bound to shut states each of those shut states being able to open. But it turns out that the four shut states there are not sufficient to account for the shut time distributions. So you had to put in extra shut states, which could be described as desensitized states. So in fact, they're pretty short lived. And you can get good fits with that model. The Efficacy for the opening reactions increases with the 30 for the triply bound receptor, but only 0.1 for the singly bound, as you might expect. But the binding constants here for the first binding is 14 millimolar, 
for the second binding is 200 micromolar and for the third is 10 micromolar. Now, that is puzzling and it doesn't happen all that, I think, like to that extent with the nicotinic receptor. You look at it this way, we're writing this down as one confirmation receptor R. If it's one confirmation, how does one binding site know that the others are occupied? Doesn't really make sense. And that led us to try a different approach. Think about what the physical meaning of an interacting binding site is. Jeffries Wyman in 1951 suggested that the cooperativity in oxygen binding to hemoglobin, which had up to then been described as interaction between sites, as in the previous slide, he postulated that it actually resulted from the fact that hemoglobin existed in two conformations, one of which had a higher affinity for oxygen than the other. But that for any one conformation, there was no interaction between the binding sites. That's physically plausible. It's a basis of the mono wyman changer reaction, which um, mechanism, which Wyman was instrumental in developing more than Chancho was. Um, suppose that there's still that there are three agonist molecules that can be bound, so we have four shut states, but that we constrain the binding to be the same for each of these molecules. That means the sites are independent on the shut resting state. But we allow a confirmation change to occur to a, a state F, which we call a flipped state. <laughs> and that these flipped states have a higher affinity for the agonist than the resting, the shut resting state. But nevertheless, the two, the bindings are independent on the two different bindings that can occur to the flipped state. And then each of these states can open with a certain efficacy. It turns out that this fits just as well, or virtually as well, as the mechanism in which these extra states were drawn on the other side up here and called desensitized. The, this shows the test of the fit. The four different concentrations of glycine were fitted simultaneously. These are the apparent shut time distributions at each concentration. And we see there's an, an excellent fit of the blue line to the blue histogram. Likewise, for the shut times, the fits are all pretty good, except a little bit here, but there aren't many shuttings in that range, so it's not, not so reliable. And the correlations also are pretty well predicted by, the, by this fit. So this mechanism fits well. This also is the p-open curve, and these lines are not fitted to it, but they're predicted from the from this mechanism and the maximum likelihood estimate of the rate constants in that mechanism. And the dashed line you can see fit, the, the solid line fits beautifully. The dashed line incidentally is the, the, the prediction if you don't allow for missed events. Mi missed shut times don't make as much difference to the P open curve as they do to uh, shut time distributions, say open time distributions but they do make some difference and even putting that correction in gave you a, a much better fit. So this was the result of fitting this flip mechanism to the to the data and we see that the binding 
to the resting state. These are all constrained to be the same for the first, second, and third binding. The equilibrium constant was 520 micromolar for all of them. It was the same for the second and third binding to the flipped state, but the equilibrium constant was much smaller, a higher affinity, 8 micromolar rather than 520 micromolar. And we still had the efficacy for the opening step increasing with the degree of liganding, which is intuitively satisfactory. So that was the single channel fits. Okay, so we can also check the fit by looking at the fit we got from single channels and seeing how well it predicts the decay of real synaptic currents. The thing is that the fit from single channels produce the Q matrix uh, with numbers in it. And that enables you to calculate just about anything you want, any the result of any sort of jump experiment of any sort of conditional distributions. Once you've got the Q matrix, you know all there is to know. And you can easily calculate the, for example, the response to a brief pulse of, of agonist. So those are spontaneous IPSCs, inhibitory postsynaptic currents in the rat's spinal cord. That's them expanded. If they're aligned at their peak and averaged, you can see various predictions fitted to the observed value. The observed value is the slightly noisy curve and it's averaged, so it's not very noisy. These are for three models that didn't fit very well and this is for the so-called flip model that did fit well. It fits the observed current not perfectly, but pretty closely, better than the other models we tried. And this is the main screen for the curve fitting program, HJC fit, which we have produced and which we give away. And I'll just quickly go through the things that are on the screen. This is the mechanism the green states are shut, the, the red ones are open. You can design any mechanism you want within the program. And this is the mechanism that I've just been talking about for the glycine receptor. These are two rate constants that are set by microscopic reversibility. You've got to say which ones are set by microscopic reversibility and how many there are. This is the number of constrained rates when you would constrain one equilibrium constant to be the same as the next one. For example, for these, the both the association rate constants are constrained to be the same and the dissociation rate constants would be constrained to be the same. So there's six constrained rates already, which are, are specified there. You can fix a rate constant to some predetermined value. That's clearly not desirable if you can avoid it. So there's none of them that way. You can also fit a rate constant and anyone you choose by specifying what the EC50 of the dose response curve is. Of course, you won't know that very accurately very often. So it's not ideal, but it's a one way out when the basic fit is 
has too many parameters to be fitted. Okay, in this green central panel, you specify the data, the data for three, four different glycine concentrations are in four different files. These are SCN files, they come from our scan um, program, which is a way of idealizing the raw data. You can use data from other idealization programs. You can also view the details of those specifications of those files. This is for set one, for example, coronate the concentration was 10 micromolar of glycine. You can set whether it's true that there's only one channel. You can set a critical shut time. That's the longest shut time, such that you can be sure that the channels before it and after it come from the same iron channel. And the various other options which you can set here, like constraining a maximum and minimum value for any estimate. The blue panel is for initial guesses. It shows the initial guess for the fit for each of the rate constants Q16, that's alpha 1. You, you can give it, a, each of the rate constants, a text name. And an initial guess for its value. And the maximum values for an association. Rate constants are set at 10 to the 9 in this case. Because anything bigger than that, you are unlikely to be able to, uh, to estimate. And in any case, rate association rate constants bigger than 10 to the 9 are not really possible except for protons at least. So when you've all checked, you can just hit fit or you can save all the, all the specifications. to an any file which you can read the next time round and repeat the fit without having to enter everything. You can also treat everything in this as fixed as your initial rate constants are actually the result of fitting. You can skip the fitting step and just show the data with the specified model. That can be useful at times. So that's it. The work on this was done to a large extent by Valeria Bertzamato, who is a, a postdoc with Lucia Civilotti. Uh, the work on the um, synaptic currents was done by Marco Beato, also a postdoc with Lucia. And and that's it. It's